In my uh, keynote this morning, I spoke about um, sustainability and the, um, uh, the topic of not just sustaining the people who are working on maintaining the software, but actually sustaining the innovation spirit uh, within uh, an open source ecosystem. And, uh, and specifically around the idea of there being a value network between the creators and consumers of technology uh, in these ecosystems. So this talk, I'm gonna delve a bit deeper into uh, the challenges that we faced in doing that and, uh, and you know, look at kind of what we do at Continuum with Anaconda uh, and how that model's worked out. And then I'll talk about sort of the, um, how I think about the open source world and uh, specifically you know, in our PyData, Python sort of space and provide ideas for how we can reason about um, how, you know, as the world changes, how do we actually keep this up? How do we um, hold on to what we've created and, and take it even further? So um, I want to start by just highlighting to everyone that actually the nature of software itself is, is changing. And I've been doing, I've been coding for uh, about 30 years now, and I've watched it change quite a lot in that time. Um, certainly businesses have changed in that time. But right now, um, we are really in a transitional space. We're really in a very interesting transformational period in software. And um, many of you in the audience, you know, maybe coding longer than me. Some of you may be coding less than me. But um, I think everyone can sort of see that you know things are different now, right? You you look back ten years ago, maybe, and you were not talking about all this sort of stuff. You were maybe talking about a language or a framework, um, and uh, and some things were changing. You know, people might talk about, oh, this is a software as a service approach. Over here, we're going to try to do some functional approach. But now, um, we have this massive disruption in all of the things that underlie what software itself does. And so, to be a software developer, to be, you know, actually wear the hat and say, yes, I'm a software developer in this day and age, you have to know about a wide variety of things that are all really changing how we think about uh, how we write software, how we test it, how we deploy it, how we manage it, how we maintain it. All these different things are changing around us. And sometimes you look at the stuff and you're like, you know, I can't handle it. This is, I just want to sit in an editor and code and be done. I don't want to learn JavaScript stuff over here. I don't want to learn VM stuff over here. I don't want to learn orchestration frameworks over there. I just want to code, right? But, um, but software is changing because software itself has always been a, a, a transitional thing, right? It's between hardware and the ultimate end business problem. So software exists because it can change faster. It can um, be molded more easily than making new ASIC chips. And so, um, so that's, that's kind of the thing that we're faced with. As software developers, we've kind of lived in this rarefied space. Um, and so as business problems, though, become, as they become more and more data-driven, the nature of how we do software also has to change. Uh, and that's at the same time that all of these infrastructure things are changing, all these VMs and, uh, and, uh, and uh, OSs and all these different platforms and all these infrastructure things are changing underneath us. At the upper end, what our software is supposed to do is also changing. And so um, one thing that's, that sort of is a corollary to this is that we actually have to think, as software itself changes, as the nature of what software is changes, the nature of what it means to be a software business also must necessarily change. And so you, know, you see a lot of infrastructure things moving to the cloud. Um, it's, some of it's moving faster than we think. Others will take a longer time. You know, a lot of core business concerns, um, they are really around data, right? And so even if you move those things to the cloud, you're still worried about those same data concerns just on someone else's computer. And likewise, de development now involves orchestration and provisioning and all these things. Um, and that, you know, you can do it in the cloud and it's maybe faster than getting something approved by IT, but it doesn't change the inherent complexity in trying to build a distributed system. That complexity is still there, whether it's on someone else's computer or on your own computer. And so, um, you know, a lot of the core challenges we're facing as software devs, they're, even if we move to cloud, they're not necessarily solved by them, right? The data concerns are not solved by merely going to cloud. So, um, so the, the, all of the technical and the business concerns around software, they're really here to stay. And um, one thing that's been interesting to watch is actually how open source and the conversation, the developer conversation on open source has evolved. That back in the day, uh, when we were first talking about open source, um, and, and this stuff really started emerging, people focused a lot on licenses, and what are the rights guaranteed to me by these licenses, and this license versus that license. And nowadays, if you go around to conferences, there's you know, some kind of turf wars between these things, but that issue is, is not nearly as 
uh, as large, does not loom nearly as large because people actually understand that it's really open source is about creating communities of developers. It's about actually empowering people to create new things and to work together. Um, and what's interesting is because people are free to innovate and they're free to create, it actually helps the creator's technology and the consumer's technology align more, much more rapidly. So that's a great thing. And then you know the famous quote from Mark Andreessen that software is eating the world. Um, if you look around, and I don't know how many of you are developers in a business or enterprise context, but it's clear that in the last 15 years, there's been a massive transition. And at this point in time, open source is not some weird, odd, like kumbaya, hippies around a tree kind of like weird stuff. Open source is standard how you do stuff, right? Um, and, and so that, that nature, the, the changing nature of software development, open source is starting to become at the core of it. And, if, and that's just the developer conversation on open source. If you look at the business conversation on open source, businesses are actually getting more savvy as well. And uh, you know, I remember back in the day, Microsoft, uh, when Linux was first starting to threaten the Windows um, uh, hegemony, I guess, the, um, the, the argument Microsoft always make is, well, it's not really free because you have to look at the total cost of ownership, right? TCO, TCO was their big argument. And it's true, it's a valid argument. But businesses now are aware of that argument and they're still moving forward with open source. Because for them, it is not about the cost of the software, nor is it even about the maintenance cost of that software. It's actually cheaper in many cases to, to have open source. But actually, the core business concerns that businesses are looking to open source for, based on my, you know, my experiences, are they want to avoid vendor lock-in and they also want to harness innovation. They want to be tied to where the puck is going. If you only buy vendor, you know, developed in an opaque black box kind of thing, you're just getting where the vendor says the puck was. Um, if you're an open source, if you're a dev teams, and if your technologists are actually engaged and plugged into the open source innovation sphere, they can actually see where the puck is going. And it may not be exact, exactly right, but at least you have some level of visibility. So businesses, um, you know, people who are high up in management, management chains and businesses, when I talk to them nowadays, they're aware of this, right? They, they really like that open source actually ties you to innovation. And of course, the vendor lock-in is something that everyone is very, very tired of. And they know that if the stuff they're relying on is in the open source, at the very least, there's a floor uh, to, the, to the cost, which is they need to hire some full-time devs to help maintain the stuff on their own. Um, but they have, they have an alternative to just being uh, roped in, looped into some vendor's proprietary stuff. And so the businesses are getting savvier about open source. The open source devs are also changing how they think about open source. And, um, and in the middle of this change and in the middle of open source getting more and more popular, we have another confounding factor that's happening, which is that people are mistaking data science coding for software development coding. Uh, a lot of IT folks just look at it as like, oh, this person is an Emacs, they must be a dev. And it's like, no, this person has no idea what they're doing in Emacs. They were told three combinations of codes so they could write a little Python script and be done, right? And so the idea that, um, you know, this, this is really problematic, actually, because uh, data science is a newly emergent field. There's not a lot of, like, uh, in data science conferences, and I would say that Jupiter is, is one such conference, um, people are still trying to figure out which side is up, right? There's a lot, of, a lot of newness in this stuff. And you can really see from a distance, it looks a little bit like software development. But the way I talk about it is that data scientists tend to use uh, code the way that my daughter uses a hammer, which is that it's surprisingly effective. She actually can get the nail in the wood. Um, and usually there's no bloodshed, but it's not how you're gonna build a house, right? So data scientists, they can definitely code uh, some stuff, but they're not gonna build a large software architecture. And they're probably not gonna really wanna maintain any of it, even if they could. And so this conflation of data science with software development, it's a common misperception. And it's, if for Python in particular, it's a really, um, it's an unfortunate sort of like albatross around the Python, uh, which is kind of a funny image if you think about an albatross tied to a snake. But, um, but you know, Python is really, really misunderstood as a language because it is applicable in so many different fields. If you're in the computer graphics field, you think of Python as one of your uh, workflow, pipeline, you know, orchestration tools. It's maybe also a, uh, an embedded scripting engine inside your 3D rendering system. If you're in the data science world, of course, Python is one of the standard go-to tools. Um, if you're in, uh, in uh, system administration and in IT, Python is a replacement for Bash, right? In every different area you go to, you can see Python being used in different ways. And so everyone's seeing a different part of this elephant. Uh, so, so it really, and, and the other thing is most languages don't have this characteristic, right? Lua is a nice embedded language. You're not going to go and build Instagram with Lua, 
right? You can go and build nice things, uh, web apps in Ruby and Ruby on Rails. You're not going to go and use Ruby to go and crunch a bunch of matrices on a supercomputer. And so most other languages don't have this kind of uh, polyglot nature. Python does, and that also means that it gets misunderstood quite a bit. It tends to get pigeonholed then by businesses, right? Depending on who's talking about the language, they're going to see it in one particular pigeonhole, and they're going to not really understand how to manage this broad polyglot uh, applicability of the language. And so into all of this conf confusion and all this transformation, uh, as software itself is changing, as the attitudes about open source are becoming savvier and changing, as data science is emerging, uh, into all of this, um, Travis and I stepped right in and we created a new company uh, called Continuum Analytics, and we wanted to see if we could build a different kind of open source company. We thought that the moment was right, there was a lot of great opportunities to see if we couldn't build technology, keep it open, at the same time uh, build useful products and services for our customers. And so a really brief history of Continuum is that we started really by bootstrapping with consulting and with some government grants and training services, things like that. Um, and that really helped get us off the ground. Let us, you know, it, it enabled us to build some early technologies and also build some, some early products. And, uh, and we, we sold these products. We had a, you know, we still you know, have a, a way that you can go and buy these individual things. Um, but we found that wasn't very lucrative. It certainly was not going to uh, pay the bills for what it costs to actually um, keep a bunch of really talented devs together working on hard problems. Um, and at the same time, we thought that we would be uh, lifted up by the winds of, of good fortune because Python and PyData, they're becoming much more popular and much more adopted in business and in industry hugely popular, right, in big data, data engineering, uh, data science. And one thing that, uh, that we found is that actually, even when you're successful, there's, um, there are problems that come with success, right? So even if your technology is exactly right, and even if your technology is incredibly useful for business critical problems, you can have technology uh, market fit and not have product market fit. And this is actually in general a problem for any company that's creating some new tech. You might find people that want to adopt your tech, um, especially if they're early adopters, right? But early adopters all always face, like you always face this challenge of the buy versus build with early adopters. And with Python in particular, and especially here in New York with all the finance and hedge funds and everything, it's a huge problem. They know exactly how powerful the technology is, and they understand exactly what they need from it. And they also have a very, very low tolerance for products that don't work. And so you put all these things together and you end up with a situation where it's actually the people who love your tech the most are the ones who are probably the worst people to trial your products, right? And that's not something that you necessarily get in a lot of other situations. If you're building some new widget, you know, you're gonna go and research the tech based on the funding you raised, you're gonna go and build the, the, the widget around the tech, and you're gonna go try to find somebody who's willing to take an early version of some widget that's got some amazing tech. Very, very straightforward and linear. With open source, people can do an end run around the products you're trying to build and simply adopt and build it themselves. So there's a lot of interesting dynamics um, and, uh, and it's a business problem that is, it's hard to articulate, it takes a bit to articulate, but it also is uh, not one that's trivial to solve. And so how do we, but we have to solve this problem if we wanna continue doing open source tech. We can't keep building tech that then cannibalizes product, right? That's not gonna be a good sustainable business model. Um, and so to address this problem, I want to you know, tell one of my favorite statistical stories, and many of you may be familiar with this, but there's this really great anecdote about how in World War II, um, the, the, uh, the, the British, they were seeing these bombers coming back from bombing runs, and they would be riddled with holes, right? Um, and so you know, when you build a bomber, you want to reduce the weight of the bomber because that means you have more fuel, you can go further, uh, you can put more ordnance on it. And so they were looking at adding plate armor to the bombers. They want to reinforce uh, various pieces. And so you get these bombers back, you look at where the holes are, and sort of intuitively you're like, well, okay, let's go reinforce the places that have the most holes. And actually a really bright mathematician, a statistician figured out, no, 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 you don't want to reinforce the holes. The places with the most holes are the places you don't need to reinforce because the plane still came back. It's the places that have no holes is where you need to add the armor. Because every plane that got a bullet through that particular spot never made it back. And so it's, it's probably one of the most beautiful, intuitive, and counterintuitive examples of Bayesian inference that, uh, that I've ever seen. But it's, 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 you know, you think about it for like another two seconds, you're like, oh, that makes total sense. Obviously, you'd reinforce the parts that you can't have any holes in. So it's a similar kind of, I tell the story because it's a similar kind of thing 
around how we sort of got our thinking around to the product development efforts for Anaconda and for, for our overall uh, activities at Continuum. And we basically decided to build things that the open source ecosystem is not building, right? Instead of going and trying to innovate faster, harder, and do more things in the space where people are willing and interested to build stuff, let's go and build the things that people are not building, either because they don't know about the problems or they're just not interested in self-servicing on those problems. And so that's led to the growth of uh, a suite of offerings uh, and capabilities in our Anacon Enterprise product. Um, we, of course, still offer consulting services and training uh, support around all of these things. And we've actually, uh, through our technology and our, um, and our product build, we've actually uh, established partnerships with lots of you know, big industry, established industry players. And, um, and it's actually kind of a really, it's a different way than you think about it, right? Like with the first products we built, like IO Pro, uh, it was like, oh, let's load your data faster because people love loading data. People do it all the time. It's slow. Let's go and load the data faster. With Number Pro, we're like, oh, well, people run their code. It's slow. They want to run it faster. I guess we're not that creative in our thinking, right? It was just make everything go faster. But it turns out that going faster is actually not necessarily the problem people want to pay money for, right? So another way that's not as uh, component-oriented, but that's more capability-oriented, Another way to look at what we do is uh, in our commercial offerings is that you know we sort of we target a number of different functional areas um, or uh, or capabilities that are looking outside of just the data scientist in a box. We look at what does the data scientist uh, actually need to do. Uh, he or she has to consume artifacts from other people in their organization, and they have to produce artifacts for other people in their organization. Let's look at all those other bridges they have to build and figure out how we can build those bridges for them and operationalize those bridges. And so uh, the, the, the whole suite of Anaconda Enterprise users, you know, we don't build, we build Anaconda for the data scientists, we build Anaconda Enterprise for the team that the data scientist finds themselves on. And so there's something in there for everyone that is involved, all the stakeholders around the data science um, operation. And so that's, that's really how we've managed to do it thus far. Uh, I think that model will continue to work for a while. Um, and, uh, and, and so I, I don't really see major differences and divergences between us and what the community needs on, on that side of things. But if we think about like the bigger picture and all of the innovation that happens uh, as you guys look at the poster session or walk around and look at the things that people are doing with Jupyter, um, there, it's clear that this is just unlocking the keys to a whole wide jungle of cool stuff that people can do. And uh, you know, I, I think about um, the early internet, you know, everyone could go and get an account with an ISP, they get an FTP site, they can go and FTP up some files, some index.html, some other stuff, and they have a website. And that worked for a number of years, um, but it was, you know, when GeoCities that made that a little bit easier, or when WordPress came along as a blogging platform, that made it easy for people to create content and share that content that really democratized the content creation on the web. Now, whether that was good or bad, you know, remains to be seen. But nonetheless, the point is that it unlocked the creative potential for everyone. I think Jupiter has a similar kind of possibility that many, many people, many more people in the world have explorations they want to do, insights they want to share, than the people who are able to do an actual data science you know, uh, site, build an actual data science app right now. So we're about to bridge that gap with this technology. And the question I want people to be thinking about, not just in this room and not just in this conference, but in the community at large, is when we bridge that gap, what problems are we going to face? How do we ensure that what's brought us thus far, we don't lose that momentum, and we don't lose the core of what's valuable in that? And so um, I'd like to introduce a, a metaphor that I use, certainly, um, to, to think about what is sustainable open source? What, is sustain what makes for sustainable communities around open source innovation? Um, and it's really about gardening, so that's the metaphor I, I want to use. Now, I don't know how many people here garden or enjoy gardening or know much about it. Um, if you play Farmville, maybe you might think of gardening in this way, as you take inputs, you transform them into other sorts of outputs. Um, and, uh, and actually, honestly, um, that's not too far from the truth, right? Real gardening does involve a lot of moving things around and transforming things, um, tending to things. There's daily maintenance you have to do. Um, you don't grind things for XP, and you don't buy things uh, in-game. Uh, currency, but otherwise, real farming does involve a lot of transformation and a lot of rote, tedious work. And so I think that the open source, I like to think of the open source um, innovation kind of ecosystem as a community garden and, uh, or a community orchard, you know, community farm, something like that, a farming cooperative. 
And so we actually can see you know, some open source devs, they sit there, they tend to their tree, they, they water it, it grows up, it bears some fruit, and, uh, and they just give the fruit away, right? And they might take the fruit and they might set it up in a little fruit stand and put a little honor box there, you know, Patreon honor box, give me some money, please. Um, and uh, in the case of like uh, GPG or OpenSSL, it was four devs tending to one small tree that everyone needed, right? Um, and the honor box was not getting filled at all. Um, there's other folks that are going to come by, they're going to pick a bunch of this fruit, they're going to package it up in their own white label thing and go sell it on market. And the open source devs don't begrudge them those profits, usually. Um, those people go and do it. And oftentimes they'll do it without really a care to think about where does this mana come from? Where do these fruits come from? Right? They'll just, it's, a, it's sort of a drive-by export. Um, and, and people do that. But um, there's still others who are going to go and try to do something a little bit closer to the field. They're going to go and set up a little farm store or a little orchard fruit stand that's actually manned, that actually has some level of service and quality control. Um, and, and of course, with the proceeds, they take some of that and put that back into the maintenance and tending of the garden. But my point is that there's many different um, folks that are involved in this ecosystem. The people who just do the drive-by, take the stuff, go and vend it, they actually serve a purpose as well. They're helping to disseminate the adoption and the popularity of the particular fruits and vegetables from your farm across a wide variety of locations that you know, people might not come to your garden or to your little uh, fruit orchard. So all of us can benefit, all of us do benefit, you know, and we all work together in this ecosystem. And we have to ask ourselves though, how do we sustain this thing, right? How do we make sure this whole thing stays viable? And, um, and sustainability is not just a process, right? It's actually an ecosystem characteristic. It's not something that only one of the players does. One, one farmer by himself or herself in this large farm and garden environment cannot ensure sustainability. Sustainability is an ethos that must permeate that entire thing. And so um, the way we do it though is we, we, we have to not be blind or, or ignore the entire value chain, the entire cycle that we're part of. So we have to actually think about the full value chain all the way up to the table of the consumer. Um, I live in Austin, it's a very uh, lovely city, and it's very sustainability oriented and very progressive in those kinds of ways. So there's a huge farm to table movement in Austin at the restaurants and at the grocery level and all these different things. So the farm to table aspect of this is what I'd like for us to contemplate as we do open source. It's not enough just to say, I am an open source dev, I really particularly love cultivating this particular kind of heirloom tomato, that's all I will do. I don't care who eats it and how they eat it and what happens to it downstream. If you do that, you're really putting yourselves, at the, you're putting yourself or yourselves at the mercy of these broader things that happen around you. you. You have to sort of take an active role in contemplating the sustainability of the ecosystem. Um, and likewise, if you're one of the vendors, right, I speak as, as someone who's uh, created a company that lives and breathes in this ecosystem, we have to be very cognizant of the entire value chain and the entire health of, the, of that, that whole system. And you know, what's unfortunate is that um, there's actually very few, there's very few historical examples that we can point to where open source communities were able to sustainably thrive based on a network of value creation. Usually it's hierarchical, or uh, usually there's a patronage of some wealthy uh, donor that makes billions of dollars a quarter, and they just throw some nickels at a couple of open source devs, right? And that's all great, but that's not sustainable. And so the history of technology, though, is very young, um, and it's changing every few years, right? It's a completely different era. So everything that happens is happening for the first time. Maybe in this ecosystem, in the Python and the PyData uh, ecosystem, we'll actually have an instance of something happening for the first time, where we actually can create a sustainable ecosystem of open source developers, creators, and innovators, and, um, and um, sustainably sort of oriented, mindful uh, commercialization of those efforts. So, um, you know, I think ultimately one of the, the questions that I would encourage people to think about is, you know, you do this farm and you think about the farm, but at the end of the day, what are you really farming, right? Uh, what are you really cultivating? You might say, well, the farm obviously produces fruits and vegetables. That's what we cultivate. That's what we work on. Uh, and then if you think deeper, you're like, well, actually, if it's more of an orchard, what we're really doing is we're tending to the trees. And every year it produces crops, it produces a, a bunch of delicious fruit, but that's not everything. The, the health of the tree is an important thing. But if you're really into farming, I don't know how many people here are really into farming, but you know that the most important thing in farming is soil management, actually. The soil 
and the entire nitrogen cycle, and of course that ties to your water and your groundwater and all these things, all of that is actually, that, that ground you stand on is what makes all of this possible. And so similarly for open source, we have to think about not just, hey, how do we make sure the dev's getting paid, right? You have to think about actually the soil itself. And for me, um, you know, taking this metaphor maybe to uh, the final sort of step, um, I think the unique resource that we have, that soil, you know, that we're, that we're actually cultivating and that we're managing and, and sustaining, that's actually the, it's, it's nothing more, nothing less than the uh, sum of all of the creative human potential that is in the minds of everyone that's plugged into the ecosystem. That's the soil. And so that's a hard thing, right? That's a very um, abstract thing, but it's actually where all this comes from. And so uh, in my keynote, I talk about sustaining innovation. It's really, it kind of comes, comes full circle on this concept that we actually have to create an ecosystem that keeps people plugged in, creates a positive community that actually lets everyone be creative and lets everyone actually uh, take the best thoughts, take the really cool things they're thinking about and express them and share them with people. That's really, that, that's it. That's all it is and yet that's like everything. Um, if we simply focus on capturing part of it or facilitating only one particular part of the cycle, we're gonna miss out on the entire circular uh, value network there. So then to make this much more concrete, how do we actually translate this into business, right? What does this mean for people who are thinking of themselves as maybe launching businesses or who work in businesses that, that intersect open source? Um, well, in the business world, there's a really great quote by, um, by Warren Buffett where he says, well, I look for businesses with wide moats, right? And that's a fine thing for Warren Buffett to say because he's an investor. He puts money in to get more money out. It's very simple thermodynamics, right? Um, and, and a lot of businesses do operate this way, right? Some people, the moat, uh, for them, the moat is the patent portfolio. Uh, for other people, it's really like odious licensing terms and it's locking in their customers and keeping them from peering out the window. And for others, the, the moat is actually technological in nature or, or even linguistic in nature, right? So you might have a proprietary language that all your customer stuff is locked up in. You might have proprietary extensions to SQL and your customers really can't leave you without upending their entire business. Um, and, um, and in thinking about this, so I'm a little bit of a history buff, but just a little bit, so I'm like the worst history buff, right? Um, and, I'm, and I'm of the opinion that the, because uh, the real history is kind of boring when you get into the details, but, <clears throat> but actually, if you think about castles and moats, you know, they're actually fine constructions given the period that they came around in. So at that time, the types of kinetic weapons that are available to people and the kind of physical threats people were facing, as well as the kind of economic structures, right? You want to scale of agriculture? Well, having a hierarchical, feudal, military you know, mechanism control was a fine way to scale agriculture at the level they were doing agriculture. But um, you know, as, you, uh, as you think about moving forward and as we develop better science technology, as we were able to increase the caloric, the average caloric uh, energy available to, to individuals, people could actually go and have leisure time, people could um, be literate, we could create societies of learning, and we could create law and have actually the rule of law. And that creates open societies that actually um, lets people engage in a general state of trust with each other. You don't need castle walls then, uh, you have courts, right? And so that's, I think, that th then allowing a village to spring up as opposed to concentrating all the wealth and all of the, the crown jewels inside some thick walls, that really has been um, kind of the prevailing inspirational model for what we do at Continuum. So Travis and I, we started the, the company, we wanted to provide infrastructure that would, um, that would enable these kinds of things to happen, uh, that were fundamentally open and free, but at the same time, we also wanted to build a company that could set an example for how we could do this right. Um, and so the, you know, we, can, we can sort of, we believe, I guess, uh, that we can uh, create technologies, incubate them, contribute to other technologies that we didn't ourselves originate, um, and do all these things in the open at the same time vend useful products to uh, a larger mass of people around the world. And so um, lately I've been doing some thinking, I've been doing a lot of reading into the history of economics and communication technology in particular uh, here in the United States. And what's interesting is if you look at the history of capitalism as it's been practiced in the last 150 years, um, it's amazing how entrenched, or how, how much entrenched players will um, destroy the very foundations of innovation if there's anything that threatens their business model at all. 
Uh, they will salt the earth. They will burn down things. They will bury lab notebooks. They will destroy lives. They will destroy infrastructure. They will do anything to preserve their business models. Uh, at the end of the day, if there's hundreds of billions of dollars of capital value at, at risk, they would absolutely do it. And so this is actually, in the technical domain, this is a challenge because virtually any innovation can unleash creative destruction on somebody's business model. And actually, in this era of quantified self, quantified world, self-driving cars, uh, you know, supercomputing, cloud supercomputing, machine learning, AI, all these different things, uh, I, don't, I don't know how to predict too much about this stuff, but I think that a lot of what people are going to do with Python for the next 10 years is destroy a lot of legacy business models. So we're really right at the intersection, right at the vanguard, really, not just intersection, we're at the vanguard of um, really unleashing a lot of this creative destructive potential. And um, if that's the potential innovation we're going to be unlocking, so the question then is how do we sustain a defense of this um, little verdant valley, this little village of innovation that we have? when we're producing these you know, nuclear weapons that are destroying all these old business models, right? What are the, when, when people start realizing that, oh, in the Python space is where a lot of the innovation is happening, let's go with our IP portfolio and start litigating against everyone, right? Or let's go and just hire people and shut down what they're doing. All these kinds of actually incredibly intentional and incredibly predatory tactics are things that have happened in technology in ages past, um, even in just the last decade or, or two. And so, for us to talk about sustainability of innovation, it's not merely doing it in some like kumbaya, forward-looking, happy-go-lucky sort of way. It's actually thinking about it also from a strategic perspective of a, a sort of a defensive mentality. How do we ensure that the great things that happen in this space actually continue to happen and continue to thrive? And I don't actually have really great answers for that, um, but I want to at least open up that question in some of the context of my thinking around it. Because I think it's really important. You know, we are one company. We've done some interesting work. Uh, we're going to continue doing, I think, interesting work and continue growing the success of our commercial offerings. But one company is not enough. We need many more companies, many other people whose livelihoods and whose impact is actually contingent upon the innovation space that's happening, um, or the innovation that's happening in this space. So with that, um, I'll open it up for questions. I think we've got about five, seven more minutes. And I'm happy to take questions, uh, feedback about anything I said, challenges to anything I've said, uh, questions about any of these things or more. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Hello. I really like the uh, gardening metaphor, and I'd also never thought about the sustainability question from like a defensive perspective, so that uh -huh. was really interesting. But putting aside the defensive part of it, mm -hmm. and just looking at the like core sustainability, I want to kind of play devil's advocate. Is there an actual sustainability crisis in open source? Because what I see is, with developers coming to open source through whatever series of motives they have, and with the high burnout rate that exists, even then you still have so much value being created that all these things, all these trends you talked about at the beginning are still happening. So is there a real, and I want the same sort of gardening to happen that you do, but just to be really kind of hard-nosed about it, is there an actual internal sustainability crisis in open source? Um, that's an excellent question. So sustainability of making new little saplings that bear a little bit of fruit is one thing. Um, the reason I bring this topic up at JupyterCon is because we are now looking in the distance. You know that last, the last scene, hopefully this isn't a spoiler for anyone, but the last scene in Field of Dreams, when the camera sort of pans out and you see a line of cars lining up that road, um, from the perspective of folks like Fernando, myself, and, and others, we look out a little bit above our, or like we climb to the hill overlooking our orchard, and we just see dust from all of the Mongols, good Mongols, happy Mongols, that want to come and use and, and partake in this ecosystem. And that's more than just, can we grow new saplings every year? That's how do we go and do 10x, 100x? You know, really there's a production aspect of the software. And that was a little bit um, to my point as well about production of knowledge artifacts, uh, maintenance of those things. That becomes a very, very heavy lift. And if we never bridge that gap, if we never, basically as a community, never grow the, um, the skills or, or the knowledge of how to do this, then the open source world will forever be seen as the, way, the place where you go to get good toys. 
But to get your real stuff, you're going to go and buy from the big legacy vendor here that's five to 10 years behind. And the cost of that is um, then not one that we benchmark against, is there cool stuff happening? Because yeah, it's, uh, there's always cool stuff happening. What we have to hold ourselves to is the higher standard of what could we have done that was much better, right? We could have saved how many more lives if these cancer researchers didn't have to pay this much for licenses for this piece of crap software, right? That's the kind of question, I think, that's the kind of standard that we should aspire to and, um, and really kind of plant our flag on that particular point. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, this might be more of a clarification question. I, that distinction between product fit and technology fit, I think, uh -huh. I, I mean, can you explain a little bit more what is the tension there? I, th I don't think I felt like I fully grasped grasp what you actually mean by that tension between those two. Yeah, so um, the question of product market fit versus technology market fit, um, I actually had a small little section of slides on the technology value chain um, where you know I, I was going to talk a little bit more about this, um, and and the the thing is that uh, when businesses it really is business facing right so when businesses consume technology um, there's sort of different levels at which they want to um, terminate their concern right and say okay at this point I'm not going to worry about it I'm assuming the vendor or the supplier we don't call it a vendor the supplier has taken care of this issue for me. When you consume technology, you're onboarding as a business, as a consumer, you're taking on a lot more stuff. When you take on a product, the vendor, the supplier, makes representations, warranties, all sorts of other things, and you can actually, you know, it's very transactional. I will give you X dollars, and you guarantee that if I have a problem, I can call somebody up and get somebody who's gonna solve this problem for me within five hours, right? So it's about um, what the business has to worry about, right? There's a difference between the, you know, where you draw the line of where it's just technology and where it's actually a product. Um, and, and really an aspect of product, I think, is the, you know, the ubiquity of the need, right? If you build a very tailored, if you just have raw technology, that can solve many, many problems. But the key word is it can solve many problems. And the actual solution is still left as an exercise for the consumer or the adopter. A product does solve problems, and it solves a very specific set of problems, and the vendor or the creator of that product believes, they're making a bet, that that exact problem that the, problems, that the thing solves is common enough that people will buy it off the shelf, right? And that's really the distinction between those two. Hey, Peter. Um, so your point about open source and business and why businesses are adopting open source, um, I wonder if you could speak at all to like, businesses being involved in open source as starting to become table stakes for even getting developers to come. Mm -hmm. And how that's driving um, open source adoption as well. Yeah, so that's an interesting thing, right? Because we see that all over the place. A lot of, lot of businesses, they're realizing that um, by showing up to the open source party, they, you know, the, uh, you know, they, they pick up cooler devs, <laughs> uh, to put it kind of crassly. And, um, and that basically, I think, summarizes kind of how I feel about that, right? That I feel like for a business to really care about open source, the way they care about, oh, their Oracle production database going down, that's the level that we should have the concern. Not this lets me, you know, cut my recruiter staff by 20% and get better devs. Like, that's, that's a very, um, that's a, what they call a, a bottom line issue, right? It's a, it's a cost uh, sort of issue. Whereas open source, for the purposes of tracking innovation, of having uh, a BATNA as a business, you know, when the vendor comes up and wants to charge you 10% more for licenses. Those are the kinds of concerns that are more forward looking. Um, and so I think the recruiter thing is great. I mean, I think it's still a great thing to get more funding into the ecosystems around open source, but it's almost sort of like, uh, oh, I have to pay. You know, it's like a pay to play kind of scheme. It just feels a little bit like, you know, it's, it's fine. They're transact they're, 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 there's a very clear transaction there. Um, and I, the reason I wouldn't necessarily want to count on it is because the instant they find some other way to target and identify and attract other devs by, let's say, having a keg in the fridge or by like having cooler office space, 
if that becomes cheaper than funding open source, guess what? You're going to get a keg in the fridge instead of funding some critical piece of open source, right? And that's why I don't like to make that, it's like a spreadsheet trade-off as opposed to an aspirational value-based investment. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, we have to finish the session there. I'm sure people will be happy to take questions. Yeah, find me around. I'll be the, the uh, continuum booth, so happy to chat. So let's thank uh, Peter again for a very nice talk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.